So good morning, everybody, and um, welcome uh, to this policy conference um, organized by Social Justice Ireland. Uh, this is the 34th annual policy conference in this series that we have organized, going back all the way to 1988. We've had one every uh, year between 1988, when we looked at poverty and family income policy, up to uh, last year, 2020, we were looking at a new social contract, a new social dialogue. And today we, we are moving on uh, to look at this whole issue of the European pillar of social rights. Um, if, you, if you want to see just from an interest point of view, uh, the, the, the whole list of conferences and the topics that we have addressed, which is quite wide ranging, a series of topics over the years. They're all on uh, the in, in the book um, of the papers, which contains all the papers of the conference. Um, and that's available on our website at this point, if people want to download it and follow along. Um, now, the issue, I suppose, uh, is uh, an issue that is the whole issue of the European Pillar of Social Rights, is an issue that is of um, major importance at this moment as we face into a quite difficult and challenging time, if you like, um, not just for Ireland, but for the European Union as well. Uh, in a way, the European Union never fully recovered uh, from the impact of the financial crisis of the late 2000s. And without a substantial and coordinated response now to the impacts of COVID-19 and Brexit and the climate crisis, the current social and economic crisis could have been, uh, could have uh, much more serious repercussions even than uh, the, the, the crash we'll say of a dozen years ago. Major change is required for survival that, that we see clearly from the cri climate crisis. But a strong response based on the European social model is essential for success. This is our understanding anyway. And this response must include investment in a sustainable future and in our social and, and human capital. It must also move towards more participative forms of governance where people have a real say in shaping the decisions that impact on them. And the European response must be focused, in our understanding, must be focused on protecting people across the life cycle protecting young and old, protecting men and women, those with an income and those without an income. And it must be sustainable, sustainable both economically and socially and environmentally, of course, as well. And above all, it must be based on the values of human rights, human dignity, and the common good, and be ethical at its core. We believe it's time to deliver on the European pillar of social rights. Focusing on the 21st century alone, we see that the original Lisbon strategy failed uh, fairly badly to address effectively the economic and social challenges of the new millennium. Um, and uh, halfway through that 10 year period, it was revised um, and uh, with a second version of it. Uh, but the, reviser, the revised version eliminated the social aspects of policy that had been a feature of its original iteration. And this decision was based on the false assumption that the social aspects of policy were holding back the economic priorities of job creation. So social policy was sidelined and marginalized. And this analysis and action in turn proved to be misguided. And in 2010, the Lisbon strategy was replaced by the European 2020 strategy. But in practice, this also has not had the positive impact on social aspects of policy that it is meant to address or was meant to address. Of particular significance was its failure to reduce poverty or to make major progress towards reaching the targets that were actually set within that uh, the, uh, strategy, the 2020 strategy. So failure during the second decade of this century to deliver on targets such as poverty reduction and cutting long-term unemployment and improving the availability of, and of quality services will have major implications for the future of the EU as it is strengthening the growing conclusion that it's not really a democratic or a social project, but is rather delivering outcomes that favor the economically powerful while talking about doing the others, um, or tackling the others, but not doing that, not being very effective in that in those areas. A more integrated policy response across the European Union is needed, 
and urgently. And our understanding is that the European pillar of social rights should be such a response. And that's what we want to address today. And we're glad for your attendance here. Um, now, uh, for, for throughout the day, uh, the conference will be chaired by Mick Clifford. Um, Mick is no stranger to um, those of you who are regular attenders at this conference, but he's no stranger to most people in Ireland either. Uh, Mick Clifford has been working as a journalist in the national media for 25 years, uh, principally in print, but quite an amount in electronic as well, on radio and on TV. He is currently the special correspondent for the Irish Examiner. In 2016, he won the Newspaper Industries Journalist of the Year Award, and he also has extensive experience in broadcast media as both a presenter and panelist, and currently he presents a weekly podcast as well. So he's author of six books, including the best-selling A Force for Justice, The Morris McCabe Story. So we're delighted that you're with us, Mick, and that you're going to chair this conference for us. And so without any further ado, I hand the conference over into the capable hands of Mick Clifford. Over to you, Mick. Obviously, a very great welcome to everybody, particularly those from outside the state. And it's very good that uh, one good to come out of the pandemic is that online conferences can be more inclusive than the physical version, thankfully. Um, quick housekeeping issue. Uh, everybody knows the question and answer function in our Zoom. And I will, if you, any questions you have, we will put to the panelists at the end of each session. We have two papers in our first session. At the end of the second paper, um, I'll convey those questions to the speakers. Without further ado, just to introduce you to our first speaker, Santina Bertolesi is Deputy Head of Cabinet for Nicholas Schmidt, Commissioner for Jobs and Social Rights. She is the Cabinet's Senior Political Advisor. She's in charge of the coordination of the European Pillar of Social Rights. She graduated in Political Science, has a Master's in Economics and International Relations, and a PhD in International Relations. Before joining the Cabinet of Commissioner Schmidt, she worked for more than 20 years in the European Parliament. Her paper is entitled A Strong Social Europe for Just Transition and Recovery. And over to you, Santina. Good morning, everybody. I uh, will try to share with you the presentation. But um, first of all, I would like to thank you for not only for inviting me um, for this conference. Uh, I feel honored uh, given um, the impressive uh, experience that um, social justice has uh, um, developed in all these years, but also for choosing this uh, item, this topic, which is very dear to, uh, to my heart, of course, which is social rights and the implementation of uh, the delivery and the implementation of the European Pillar of Social Rights. And even more so because today is the fourth anniversary of the proclamation of the pillar. So we also celebrate the fourth years of, of uh, the proclamation in Gothenburg, and uh, we celebrate it in a moment um, where, and I mean in 2021, social issues uh, due to the pandemic um, also ha have come to the forefront and uh, have uh, pushed forward the need for um, balanced uh, social and economic uh, measures deployed in reaction to the crisis. And I think that, um, as it was also uh, briefly mentioned by Sean before, this time Europe has uh, shown um, solidarity and has reacted differently from the previous crisis. Um, but let's try to um, focus on, um, you asked me to present uh, the main features of the um, European Pillar of Social Rights Action Plan. Let's try um, to focus on this and try to underline some um, key aspects and also key measures later on in the, um, in the presentation. Um, uh, from uh, the, um, you know, as I was saying, we have now four years of the pillar and we have moved from Gothenburg 
to Porto, actually, because 2021 was a very important year due to, uh, to the Porto Summit, because we have endorsed in Porto the action plan which was adopted uh, by the Commission at the beginning of March 21. And um, there's no need for me to present the 20 pillars of the, the 20 principles of the pillars. I think that they are well known. And the importance of these principles is, um, is even um, becoming greater given uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the reality we are confronted due to the COVID-19. Uh, and uh, even the, the approach of the pillar base on the three areas of equal opportunity, access to the labor market, uh, fair working conditions, and social inclusion remains, remains valid. And not only they remain valid, but they have also become a key element of the pillar, and the, uh, together with the social scoreboard and the monitoring of uh, the, the economic and social developments within the member states. Uh, it is important to focus on the political commitment. And uh, as I said, um, we had commitments for the main three institutions with the pillar when the pillar uh, was adopted in Gothenburg, but it was necessary to um, re-engage the, the political European institutions, re-engage the stakeholders, re-engage member states at all levels, uh, with the view uh, to progress with the implementation um, to the implementation of, of the pillar and uh, this uh, as I said was possible because um, the implementation of the pillar was a key political objective endorsed by this commission by the president of, the, of this commission and it has become a reality uh, in a moment where uh, we had also to face um, the challenges arising from the COVID, but also from the shifts toward greener economy and more digital economies against the background of the digital, uh, of the demographic changes. And we have launched uh, the action plan for the pillar, which sets out the vision for the next 10 years coming after the Lisbon strategies, having this uh, background and having in mind that we had to have a long view, long term view, but also to be able to tackle the immediate consequences of the COVID crisis. And um, we, uh, we have done so taking into account uh, those dimensions. And that's why, in a way, also putting the words of the President of the Commission, Mrs. von der Leyen, the, the, the European Pillar of Social Rights has become um, the, the new uh, social rule book for, for Europe, and it has, really, it's, uh, be has become a beacon for the employment and, and social uh, policy. And we are doing this because it's necessary, because of the economic and social resilience being part of the same success story of the social market economy model of the EU, and either we manage to achieve that or we fail in our project, in our integration project. But it's also important because these key issues are uh, considered the most important by the citizen themselves. Uh, when we have carried out the uh, Eurostat uh, survey, it was uh, not surprising, I have to say personally, that nine on 10 respondents have uh, stressed that uh, social Europe and social issues are very important for them uh, personally. This shows that we, uh, by strengthening and implementing the, the social pillar, we are doing um, the right thing and also um, important to, to say that the respondents in Ireland um, towards the, the, the importance of the social aspect was even higher than, than the European average. Um, and so uh, we are uh, confident that we are on, 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 uh, on, on, on the good track by having put forward an action plan. And the key objectives of this action plan um, is that uh, the commitment of, the, of, this, uh, of this commission has uh, been uh, to um, put that into practice already while we act into the crisis. And as, as we said before, this time there was a paradigm shift. We have replied to the COVID crisis with solidarity. And I would like to remember that not only we had suspended the, uh, growth, um, the Stability and Growth Pact with escape clause, but one of the key measures we have taken immediately uh, after the, the um, 
after the, 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 the pandemic was the adoption of the temporary support for unemployment risk, for mitigating unemployment risk, what we have called SURE, which has created a European uh, scheme, supporting scheme uh, for uh, introducing short time work schemes and preventing job losses, supporting um, companies to keep workers uh, employed, preserving human capital. It's been a huge success. It's now been uh, fully implemented. We have uh, used almost the 10, um, the, almost 100 billion uh, budget. And uh, I think that it's a good uh, lesson on which we have to build for the the future. But not only we have uh, put in place this action plan to, to, to answer to the crisis, but also to, um, to tackle, um, to tackle the, the, as I said, the consequences, uh, which have hit in particular certain categories of our population, groups uh, uh, that uh, are in particular among youth, uh, precarious workers, women, and also certain sectors like uh, we know the tourism, the cultural sector, um, the accommodation, and in particular in, in certain regions. So this has been uh, against the background of the measure that we have put forward in, in, in the action plan. Also because the action plan and its implementation is basically the strategies for rebuilding better. And together with the next generation EU, uh, the implementation of the pillar really has the ambitions of rebuild the EU on more um, on fairer and, and more resilient basis. Um, as, as Sean was mentioning that we have failed in achieving the, the, Lisbon, uh, the Lisbon agenda uh, targets, I would like to uh, stress that notwithstanding that we have set again the ambitions of having new targets because by setting new targets at European level and national level, we commit member states in achieving them and actually member states have committed to achieve these targets and which are the targets that we have set remirroring the approach of the pillar. We have set a target in terms of employment rate. And as we said, we're setting a vision for 2030 and we have agreed that we, the aim is to reach at least 78% of adults um, aged between 20, 20 to 64 in employment by, 30, uh, by 2030. And the current level is 73%. Um, and we have uh, also uh, sub targets aiming at uh, women uh, employment rate and really reaching out and at needs at young people that are not in, not in, in training and employment or education. Uh, we have focused a second target on skills at skills and building skills is key with a view uh, to tackle the transitions and have inclusive transitions. And we have set a target of 60% of the adult participating in the training at least once a year. And then what's, what is very dear to my heart, we have set the, uh, the, the target of reducing poverty of at least um, 15 million of people at risk of poverty and social exclusion and underline at least, uh, in particular with regard uh, to the, the, the 5 million, uh, which concerns the target of lifting children out of poverty. And this is an effort that we take very much uh, um, seriously and we will spend a couple of words on also on measures like such as the European uh, child guarantee that we have adopted to, uh, to that regard. Uh, these targets are set at European level, but member states have to translate that at national level and they are doing so and this has to be done by the beginning of 22. And, um, the, 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 uh, we know that, of course, member state situation is different. They're starting from different, uh, different uh, thresholds, but also, also those member states that have already achieved the European targets have to go ahead and continue and continue that, that, that work. Why uh, we are confident that we have put the right um, the, the, the right motion is because uh, we really. Uh, rely on the fact that the Porto Social Summit, uh, Summit and the implementation of the commitment taken there, both with the social commitment that has put together the institution, the social partners, the civil society, but also with the Porto Declaration, the leaders have engaged uh, um, have engaged towards uh, the, the achievement of the target and have committed also to follow up at the highest political, uh, political level. Uh, the Porto Declaration has stressed 
that uh, the support will be around the, the series of package, legislative and non-legislative. We will see them soon more in, 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 in detail. And they have really um, also committed by taking up in the European Council conclusion of uh, the 25th of June following Porto, the uh, achievement of, of the targets towards um, uh, and in the framework towards 2030 and in the framework of, uh, of this semester. Here, I would like to stress the key role of the social scoreboard that together with the action plan has been updated to take up new headline indicators, notably uh, the one on, on child poverty, for instance, because I said this is a top priority for, for us. Um, of course, uh, leaders' engagement is not enough. We know very well that we need to engage forces everywhere. That, that's why the implementing the pillar is a joint responsibility. Of course, member states uh, retain most of the competencies in terms of social and employment issues, but the, we are very much committed at European level. My commissioner is very much committed to implement the pillar, and we are... Um, working very closely with the other institutions, with the Member States and the European Parliament. But at the same time, we know that social partners have a key role to play in implementation and they have to be fully involved at European and national level, but also civil society and also the local and regional level. That's why uh, we can only uh, succeed if we rely forces and uh, we join forces in, in the achievement of the objective. Why are we also confident that we are on the right track? Because this time there are funds. Uh, as we said, of course, we um, uh, we know that uh, having adopted the next generation EU package has been a, a, a qualitative leap in the history of European integration. Uh, this creates a, a huge opportunity um, for really rebuilding back uh, better, but it creates huge opportunities for member states in the moment that they design and that now they are about to implement because we have already uh, given the green light to 22 national recovery and resilience plans. And we have to say that so far we can see that member states have more or less devoted 30% of their investment and reforms as foreseen under the recovery and resilience facility to social expenditure, including health. And this is encouraging because uh, let's remember that this facility did not set any target for the social expenditure. It had done so for green and digital, 37 for green, 20 for digital, but not social. And we are happy to see that member states, and uh, rightly so, are devoting investments to uh, the, the social employment field up to uh, at least a 30%. And we will monitor that because we, will, uh, we are waiting to adopt an implementing act which will uh, allow us to monitor this social expenditure. And then, you do, of course, I would like to focus on the European Social Fund tax. Traditionally, historically, this is a key fund for tackling the uh, social uh, issues and for creating upward convergence. That's what we try to do uh, with, with the RRF. Uh, we, I would like to focus that not only we have the 25% focus on social inclusion, but we managed to have the mm, devoted benchmark of 5% to child poverty, to fighting child poverty for those member states uh, where the um, child poverty is above the ROP, the European uh, at risk of poverty level uh, at that, that average. And we really uh, are seriously, will be seriously followed up within the semester and a country specific recommendation on that on that aspect. That's why, as I said, the, the, the updated and revised social scoreboard is, is really precious. It's really precious for us to implement, but it's really precious because member states and at the, at the level of the ministries of the committees are working are now also for the, the, the secondary target. As you have seen, we have introduced new headline targets. And in particular, as I said, for child poverty, for measuring this employment gap for, for the disabled, but also to look more carefully at housing costs because this has is having a huge impact on uh, on poverty. Um, we can now um, try to look at at the uh, the, the, the different areas. Um, uh, the different areas on which the action plan has focused because we have the three areas as we said: equal opportunities, access to the labour market, the and working conditions and, and the social integration. And let me zoom a little bit in certain, in certain uh, specific initiatives that I would like to put under the spotlight. As, as um, 
with regard to creating more and better jobs. Together with the action plan, we have adopted a recommendation, a, council, a, a commission recommendation, which was called EASE. It's a package based on uh, active labor market, uh, hiring incentives, uh, skill, uh, skill reskilling, upskilling, reskilling policies, uh, focusing especially on vulnerable um, workers, targeting youth, and uh, we are very much pushing forward this approach also into the recovery and resilience plans, and we will do so also with the upcoming recommendation, council recommendation, which will tackle the uh, social and employment aspects of the climate transition. This is recommendation has to be seen together with the reinforced youth guarantee that we had already adopted in, uh, in 2020, because uh, it is about not only preserving jobs, but ensuring the reallocation of jobs into the labor market, which is taking place due to the green transition, but also because of the acceleration of the digital transformation. And we know that some jobs will be created, many will be destroyed, and we have to ensure that this reallocation of, um, of the labor market. It is very important that member states are proactive and the European Commission are proactive and also resources are spent. That's why we really support hiring incentives in this regard. And uh, our um, key uh, proposal, it's, it's the one related to uh, the, the directive on adequate minimum wages. Uh, this directive is really uh, a, a very important uh, initiative for my commissioner, but for all the commission, because it's if you want, it's the symbol of the paradigm shift of this commission. If faced with the crisis, uh, um, differently from 2010, we have put forward a directive which aims at increasing minimum wage, of creating a positive dynamic towards upward social uh, convergence by uh, pushing a positive wage dynamics. And together with that, uh, we'll uh, also come, um, we will also come uh, and we are working at it right now with a specific proposal to tackle platform work. Uh, as we have said, it's important to create new jobs. New jobs are created, but these jobs need to have social rights embedded in them. And this is not the case. We are experiencing a number, an increasing number also of court cases for um, workers uh, under platform uh, uh, work, which are not recognized as such and which uh, have uh, to live with strained working conditions. Now, we really want to tackle this problem. That's why uh, very soon, in a couple of weeks, we will come up uh, with this um, directive. Uh, and our aim is, is to ensure that workers uh, are considered as such, as employees, unless um, we can prove the contrary. Uh, I think that this is a very important piece of legislation we will come up with. And in creating better and new jobs, I also would like to focus on what we will come up with, because this is very much linked also to the fight against social poverty and exclusion. We will come up very soon with an action plan for the social economy. Uh, social economy has a huge role to play in this um, more sustainable um, model that we want to build after the COVID. This, uh, this um, European Union, which puts people at the center for this economy, which is for the people. And this is also uh, very dear to, to the commissioner. And we have also um, put forward uh, the package on the skills agenda, where we come forward with the individual learning accounts. A skills is a right for the workers, has to be it has to go with working conditions and we need massive investments from the public and also the private sector. That's why also uh, the national plans of recovery and resilience facility, like this, are devoting uh, uh, good resources to that effect. Um, as I was saying, and coming close to, to, to the end, um, we are very much looking at social protection and inclusion. Uh, of course, as we said, uh, minimum wages play an important role because uh, we tackle poverty, at least starting by tackling in-work poverty. And we know that one out of 10 uh, workers live in, in difficult uh, working condition and link lives in work poverty. That's the first aim, but this is not enough. We have to see our action uh, tackling uh, poverty in a, in, a, in a combined and global vision because we have proposed the European Child Guarantee, and now member states have uh, appointed their coordinators. National plans are to be presented by March 21. And as we said, we are really closely working with member states for the implementation of the, of the European Child Guarantee, which is really focused 
uh, on the children in need. Uh, for those, we have to ensure equal opportunities because we need to break the disadvantage, the psychological disadvantage and of poverty starting from childhood. We will come forward with a minimum income recommendation in 2022, so this year, and this will, of course, build, uh, um, uh, in, build in with the, the framework of minimum wage, European child guarantee. And we have started the beginning, this is only the beginning. A work on uh, on homelessness and and uh, on housing by launching uh, the platform. Um, the platform again, we do we did that under the Portuguese presidency, which has given such a boost to the social dimension in the in the EU. And we will continue to work on that. In the same time, we also have um, a high level working group, which is reflecting on the future of uh, the social protection and welfare state, and will come with a report this year. There are so a lot of initiatives ongoing, and we would like to put them really under the spotlight because. I think that we are really committed and we need uh, to join these efforts all together um, uh, to, to, to progress uh, and, and to achieve the result because now it's really the crucial moment. Either we manage to get out of the recovery, building back better and uh, really uh, delivering on the promises of a shared uh, of a shared future and a well-being for all our citizens, otherwise we failed an historic opportunity. And I think that here everybody agrees that social justice and social progress are key values that are to be transformed concretely. They are a cornerstone of the European integration project, but they are uh, also concrete deliverables that we uh, are trying to put in place with the action plan and the social pillar, which really is so rich that it has a long-term vision. I think that our object objective today and all the days to come is really that we work together so that European uh, Union emerges a fairer, more resilient, economic and socially from this crisis. And I think that just working together, we can try to achieve this. Thank you very much Thank you for your attention and eager to listen to all the colleagues which will, uh, who will take the floor now. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Santina, um, for a very interesting paper. And just to repeat, uh, somebody may have missed the glitch or any latecomers, we are going to have a question and answer at the end of each session, and you can use the Q&A function on your Zoom, and I will convey that to our speakers. Now, our next speaker is Michelle Murphy. Michelle is a Research and Policy Analyst with Social Justice Ireland. She's responsible for Social Justice Ireland's European engagement, including the European Semester and the Pillar of Social Rights. Our paper is Delivering the European Pillar of Social Rights, Challenges and Opportunities. Over to you, Michelle. Thanks, Mick. So I'm just going to share my screen now and you might let me know uh, if you can see it there. Yeah. Yep. Great. OK, so um, I'm delighted to follow on from Santina as well. And, and it's great to hear all the work about the progress at the European level, especially after the, the Porto summit. So in this presentation, I'm going to look at some of the challenges facing the EU in terms of delivering the pillar of social rights, look at some trends in the, the key headline target areas, and then also look at some uh, proposals at a European level that would help to deliver on the ambition of the pillar and, and on the targets set out in the pillar itself. So as Fantina mentioned, um, the, it, the pillar of social rights, it's Europe's social rule book, and it's there to, to uh, support member states as they recover from the pandemic and, you know, meet the, the twin transitions that are, that, that are going to be challenging for us. And I suppose it'll be judged on whether it can truly deliver social rights across all member states. Um, I mean, Santina outlined the headline targets. I just reiterate them here. And I think it's, it's important to note that once again, it's good that there, that, that there are social targets that, that member states have to meet between now and 2030 and that can be monitored in terms of progress and, and the impact of social policy across both the union and in member states themselves. I suppose the, the context itself is challenging in terms of the failure to meet some of the 2020 targets on poverty and employment. I mean, after the financial crisis, there has been an uneven recovery across the EU as a whole. Uh, and even before COVID, pre-COVID, after seven years of uh, consistent growth, there was still almost 15 million people unemployed, of which 5.8 million were long-term unemployed. And then in terms of risk of poverty, there was still 84.5 million people across the EU at risk of poverty. 
including more than 18 million children, which you know, points to the challenges that we face in delivering on the, those key targets, particularly in relation to reducing the number of children at risk of poverty and social exclusion. And I suppose it also points to the need for a really strong European social model to to deliver um, to deliver those targets for people across all stages of the life cycle, young people, old people, men and women, those with incomes and those with no incomes in the context of the, the ambitious targets that Europe has set itself in terms of the European Green Deal as well and in meeting the digital transition. So I'm going to look at some trends now in the, I suppose the, the key areas. And the first area I'm going to look at is employment and of course my computer has frozen here we go um so this just graph shows you uh employment in europe uh from 20 to 64 from 2008 to 2020 and what you see is that even pre-covid uh the employment target for the 2020 strategy was going to be missed um obviously there's significant variations in employment rates across the eu um with sweden having having the highest rate but I suppose concerningly, Greece has one of the lowest rates and the, the employment rate in Greece and in Cyprus actually is still lower than it was in 2008. So I suppose that, that is a, a trend of concern. Then there's also the trend of um, increased temporary employment and part-time employment. Uh, in terms of part-time employment, about one-fifth of the labour force in the EU works part-time and three-quarters of those are women. Um, and one-quarter of those people are looking to work full-time but are unable to get the hours. In terms of temporary employment, then uh, that is a trend that has been growing, particularly among younger workers, which is of concern in terms of both the, the pay that... The, the, that they accrue was generally less than their permanent counterparts and their opportunities for career progression and for training, for example, uh, are generally lower. So that's certainly a trend um, to be aware of and a trend for the European Commission to be looking at in member states. Youth unemployment continues to remain challenging. I suppose the highest rates again are in, in um, Greece and Spain and Italy, which is concerning given those countries had some very high rates after the financial crash, crash and some of them with rates of over 50% in 2012. And finally then here, the, the, the rate of NEAT, uh, the NEAT rate. So that's young people who are not engaged in employment, education or training. That's also high, which is concerning. It's about 11% in 2020. And again, the highest rates is one of the highest rates is in Italy. Almost one in five young people are in the situation, which is really concerning. Then Romania and Cyprus and Bulgaria also have high need rates. So, I mean, that is an area that was of concern in the 2020 strategy. It's also one of the sub targets of the um, so Pillar of Social Rights Action Plan there. So the, the sub targets there to have the gender employment gap, uh, increased provision of um, formally, formal early childhood education and care, obviously, which will uh, go to support having the gender employment gap and then decreasing the rate of young people who are not in employment education or training. And that will be challenging. And there's a need to focus, I suppose, in that cohort, young people who are disabled and young people from a migrant background are more likely to fall into this category. So the, there will need to be a focus on those groups between now and 2030. There's also a specific sub-target to ensure labour market participation of other underrepresented groups. So older people, for example, people with lower skills, people with disabilities, those living in rural and remote areas. And, and others. So, I mean, overall, there has been progress since 2010 in terms of employment, and that has been welcome. Um, I suppose the pandemic has particularly worsened the situation of young people. So, uh, you know, it's very welcome to hear the, the allocation of the social fund focus on, focused on young people. I think that's really important. Um, the pandemic will probably aggravate those trends I, I outlined in terms of temporary employment, part-time employment, youth unemployment, so a strong focus, I suppose, on, on investment in social policies is really going to be required across the member states to meet the, both the overall target and the sub targets set out in the in the action plan. In terms of education and training, then um, these are the 2020 targets. So the early, uh, reduced 
in a very school leaving rate to below 10% to increase the completion of third level education to at least 40% across the EU and um, uh, a target on lifelong learning to an average of at least 15% of adults participating in lifelong learning. Now, in terms of education and training, the early school leaving rate, the target has been met, the rate was marginally below the target. But as always, there are disparities between member states and some states still have very high rates. So Malta, Spain, Romania and Italy, for example. So going forward, there will have to be some sort of strong focus on, you know, continuing to reduce the rates, not only in, in the countries with high rates, but those countries which, which have met the target. Of concern, obviously, is that uh, young disabled people have, you know, an early school leaving rate of over 23%. So that cohort should be a key focus for, for the pillar of social rights targets going forward. So while progress has been made here, significant challenges do remain, particularly among young people with a disability and young people from a migrant background. In terms of third level education, that target has been reached, which is very welcome. And some countries, um, Ireland among them, have rates at or over 50%, which is very welcome. However, other countries have lower rates, um, particularly Romania, Italy and Hungary. And you can see the gap there between the higher achieving member states uh, and those who are below the Europe 2020 target. So there, there's still work ongoing in terms of um, improving the completion of third level education across the EU. Then in terms of lifelong learning, I suppose that this target has not been met. Again, there is a very great variation across Europe. Um, the, the Nordic countries tend to do best in terms of lifelong learning. And you see Sweden has a, a rate of almost 29%, Finland almost 28%, Denmark 20%. However, at the under end of the scale, um, you have rates as low as 1% in Romania, for example, and lower rates in Bulgaria and Slovakia. So there's still a significant amount of work in terms of increasing the number of people, adults uh, in, engaged in lifelong learning and in training. Because it, the target for the pillar, the headline target is that 60% of all adults and the action plan notes that you know, this will be crucial uh, in terms of meeting both, both social rights, but also in terms of adapting to the transitions, the, the digital transition, the green transition. And um, the OECD in this, the recent skills outlook also focused on lifelong learning as a key for individuals to su succeed in labor markets and societies shaped by trends such as environmental changes, digitalization, and indeed sudden shocks such as the pandemic. So I suppose it would be crucial for the two sub-targets there uh, to be met. So the digital skills and the early school leaving sub-target. And I suppose to this end, uh, public investment across the life cycle with a particular focus on, on adults um, will be key, but also a, a focus on on children and young people to ensure that we don't get to the point that we have a significant portion of adults, for example, with, with low digital skills, that, that we begin to move into a space where, where we're beginning to sort of prevent the early school leaving and other issues by investing in, in education, um, in education, in early childhood education, in training, in skills development significantly across the EU. Now, in terms of poverty and social exclusion, the 2020 strategy was to reduce the number of Europeans living in or at risk of poverty or social exclusion by 20 million. Um, this target will, will be missed. The average rate uh, was 21.4% in 2019, so that's more than one in five Europeans. Now, there has been considerable improvement in some member states between 2008 and 2020. So, so you can see this chart here that some member states they have made significant improvements, which is very welcome. But I suppose despite several year, years of growth, uh, economic growth in particular, there have been still very uneven developments in terms of the income distribution. And this has limited the progress towards the target, which would be concerning. And I suppose an area of particular concern would be child poverty, which is one of the specific uh, targets of the 2020 strategy. So looking at child poverty then over, over the past 10 years or so, there's still about 22 million children in the EU at risk of poverty or social exclusion. And despite you know, significant progress again in some member states since 2008, the, the rates of child poverty are still 
very, very high and the position for some children continues, continues to be very negative. And I suppose this is a very concerning, not only for the children and their families, but also for the EU as a whole in terms of the long term consequences, both the social and economic consequences in the longer term. So I suppose that that's what makes the, the importance of the, the child poverty target that at least 5 million of those who should be lifted out of poverty or social exclusion should be children so important in the pillar of social rights. And the action plan itself states that this should contribute to breaking the intergenerational cycle of, of poverty. And I suppose this will be a challenge. It will require full implementation of the child guarantee. And also it will require work in areas such as the country specific recommendations, for example, and linking that social investment to improved outcomes for, for people at risk of poverty and social exclusion and putting the focus on improving the social outcomes for for people throughout Europe. Now, so I, I focus there on, on the challenges and they're certainly significant, um, but there's also opportunities that we have to, to deliver on both the ambitions of the pillar and also on the targets set out in the pillar. So um, in this part of my presentation, I'm going to look at first um, some alternatives in relation to income and work, which are vital not only to social well-being and economic development, but also to meeting the digital and the green transitions. And then I will also look at, I suppose, some specific proposals then at a European level to ensure that we actually meet the ambitions and the targets set out in the pillar of social rights and, and, and in the action plan. So in terms of alternatives, I suppose uh, the pandemic has, has and the implementation of emergency income supports and the subsequent wind down of those has led to, I suppose, mounting discussion and pressure at a European level as to how sufficient a right to sufficient income can be delivered across the EU. And as Santina mentioned there, the, the, a high level group looking at the future of social protection and the social welfare state in the EU has been established to report. And I imagine that group will be looking at um, many of these issues that I, I just want to point to here. The minimum wage, as Santina mentioned, principle six of the pillar asserts the rights of workers to fair wages, fair wages that provide a decent standard of living. And the Commission launched proposals in October last year for a new directive on adequate minimum wages, which is a really important step in terms of effective action here at, at an EU level. This was the living wage is also a, a concept that it, it's not new, support for it is growing, there's expanded research and the living wage assumes that work should provide an adequate income to enable people to afford a sociable, socially acceptable standard of living, a minimum standard of living. So it differs from the minimum wage in terms of its evidence base and it looks at consensual budget standards to establish that, that minimum essential cost of living. So in a sense, it's, it's, it's an income floor in terms of wages. Um, minimum income schemes then, as Santina mentioned this as well, and, and the forthcoming proposal. And I suppose it's important to, remen to remind for, for those of us, for example, in Ireland, there, there is a minimum income scheme and we have access to a social protection system, but not every, not every EU citizen and every member state has access to a minimum income scheme. And I suppose the social protection systems that we have across the EU are, are the bedrock of a, of a social Europe. And it's important that we have minimum income schemes to be a safety net of last resort. And principle 14 of the pillar um, states that everyone lacking sufficient resources has the right to adequate minimum income benefits, which is incredibly welcome. And this, I suppose, will require significant political will and involvement of all the stakeholders that Santina outlined in her presentation to really deliver on this. And finally, then, uh, basic income obviously has, has gained a lot. It's been around a long time, but I suppose it's gained considerable attention in recent years, um, not least in light of the pandemic. Um, the team passed a resolution acknowledging the benefits of a basic citizenship income, for example, and stated introducing a basic income could guarantee equal opportunities for all more effectively than the existing patchwork of social benefits services and programs. Um, so a basic income, it involves giving everyone a modest yet unconditional income and letting them top it up at will for, with income from other sources. So 
the one thing the pandemic has shown us is that we do need alternatives to, to the current situation if we are going to build back better, if we are going to support member states to meet new challenges, the digital transition, the green transition and other challenges that may arise. So, so these are all, all areas that I'm, I would hope that a high level group is going to look at. Then in terms of employment, this is another area meeting the challenge of the changing world of work that the pillar of social rights you know, as a social rule book has to address. And I suppose basic questions are being asked is, can the market economy deliver what's needed in terms of employment and work? And we need to start considering things such as valuing all work, for example. And the pandemic has highlighted the enormous economic and social contribution of traditionally unpaid and voluntary workers, especially as many vital services uh, were suspended, including education and childcare. So there, there is a need to recognize all work including work in the home, work done by voluntary carer, carers and volunteers across the community and voluntary sector and civil society, because their contribution is significantly, significant rather both economically and also in terms of social well-being. In terms of looking at unemployment then and, you know, the potential impact of uh, the green transition, for example, on unemployment in particular sectors and perhaps long-term unemployment job guarantee schemes, um, the discussion around this has been ongoing, but it looks at involving governments promising to make jobs available to any qualifying individual who is ready and willing to work. So the concept involves governments absorbing workers displaced from private sector employment, paying at the minimum, paying an individual at the minimum wage. These schemes, they're not intended to subsidize private, private sector jobs or undercut jobs that are already available, but they're intended to support people in times of high unemployment. And in terms, finally, then moving to the shorter working week, you know, COP26 has just went down and, um, you know, there, there's been a lot of discussion around the outcome, but I suppose one of the things that has come out of that is the, the need, how we're going to adapt our societies and our economies to meet our targets. And one of the potential ways is to look at a shorter working week. And um, the New Economics Foundation has proposed a rebalancing, looking at 30 hours a day or a four day week. And I suppose the pandemic has, I suppose, um, introduced an unprecedented experiment in this. Um, and the, the Shore Fund with active support for short time working has combined with the digital home working to look at transforming our expectations around work and also looking at the principle within the pillar of social rights on work-life balance, for example. So I think the right to meaningful income and the meaningful work and the right to sufficient income are going to be two key topics for discussion between now and 2030 as we meet the new challenges both in individual member states and for the union as a whole. Now I'm going to conclude now with just some policy proposals at a European level to, I suppose, to deliver on the ambitions of the pillar. We'll start with ensuring greater coherence of European policy and to, you know, to follow on from President von der Leyen's integration of the SDGs and the pillar of social rights, uh, integrating the SDGs into the pillar and to integrate these into the economic processes of the European semester, uh, to uh, legislate for the pillar of social rights so that they influence the macroeconomic procedures and taking greater account of social impacts um, when making country specific recommendations, for example, um, addressing inappropriate EU government structures that that may inhibit um, legitimate investments by national governments. So looking at the investment uh, rules, looking at a golden rule, for example, looking at exempting uh, green investment from, from the current fiscal rules, looking to advance proposals for a guarantee of an adequate minimum income or social floor across the EU, including not just income, but access to childcare, education, healthcare, other services, that guarantees every EU citizen at least a minimum social floor. Monitoring and addressing poverty among, particularly among subgroups such as children, young people, the working poor, as Santina outlined, and older people will be really important to make sure we meet our, our targets and to ensure that the European Social Fund is being directed to those areas where it's needed most. A focus on youth unemployment is vital and also recognizing that young people, particularly those in that need category, um, will need support over a long period of time because they're experiencing multiple disadvantages. Support for developments of this in the social economy would be really important that would benefit both people in need, but also be consistent with the social investment package. And would, it would be linking social impact to 
to European funds and, and making that connection for, for European citizens, improving representation and EU policy making by meaningfully engaging with stakeholders representing those who are, are most at risk of poverty and social exclusion. In terms of structural funds, I suppose it's important that they're of sufficient scale to bridge the gap between the economic and social dimensions of policy. And finally, that um, for the EU to adopt a human rights strategy to prevent the violation of human rights, the human rights of Europe's population. And I suppose these proposals, it, we believe if fully implemented, they would support the achievement of the targets set out in the pillar of social rights, the ambition of the pillar and the ambition of the action plan and the social scoreboard. And indeed, they're, they're essential to realising the ambition of President von der Leyen for, for a social rulebook that delivers for everybody and really ensures so solidarity between generations and then allows the European Union and a stronger social Europe to meet the challenges of digital transition, green transition, recovery from the pandemic and whatever other challenges that we may face. So thank you very much. I'm going to, I'm going to stop my screen sharing now. Thanks very much, Michelle, and thank you for that paper and um, certainly plenty of food for thought there. We have a couple of questions um, that I might put to both of you, if you don't mind. And in particular, I just spotted this one from Dave Quinn. Uh, can Santina speak about the issue of guaranteed minimum income and how that might compromise efforts to have a universal basic income policy implemented. Would the EU consider contributing to a pilot UBI scheme in a small country such as Ireland? And while that is addressed to Santina, I would ask her to go first, but I'd also like to hear uh, Michelle's view on such uh, uh, a question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mick. Thank you, Dave, for the question. As I said, we are starting now uh, our preparatory work with a view to uh, present the proposal, which will be proposal for a council recommendation for the minimum income. It is. It will be around quarter three of uh, 2022. Uh, the approach we have taken so far is not of a universal guaranteed minimum income but it's building uh, on the existing in a sense that first of all, we are uh, looking at the existing situation in all member states. Now all member states have a minimum income schemes. Uh, it was not the case some years ago and we arrived to that result because of thanks to the country specific recommendation in the semester process. And then we will have to tackle adequacy of minimum uh, income schemes, um, coverage, of, um, of such schemes, uh, accessibility, reach out. So we are now working on a series of criteria which are key with the view, the design of um, minimum income schemes. And uh, at this stage, we are not opting for a, a universal um, minimum income, but we are targeting uh, people in need or people in certain situations, be it due to um, structural long-term issues related to poverty, due to the transitions or due to a certain moment uh, with, uh, uh, along the, the, the life cycle. Um, so that is uh, the, the work, the preparatory work we are doing so far. Of course, uh, as I said, it's the beginning of, the, of, of the, uh, this path. We do not do that in isolation because not only we, uh, of course, we use the, the, the feedback from the consultation we had, but also inside the house here with the other DGs, the other director uh, generals, with the other commissioners. And um, well, we will have as, uh, as usual, starting from the minimum wage to the platform work, have to find a position which would be a compromised position acceptable to all uh, the commission. I cannot say much more at this stage. And the, the concept of UBI, uh, Santina, is, is that something that has been discussed at any level within the Commission? And uh, I, I, as was suggested by the, the Mr. Quinn, the, 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 who issued the question, um, the, the idea that uh, perhaps a pilot scheme could be uh, tried out, particularly in, in one of the smaller countries, uh, as Ireland is, for example. 
we have looked carefully at the scheme that Finland had put in place uh, in, the, in all the preparatory, prepa <laughs> preparatory work and analytical assessment we have done so far. We have devoted particular attention to, the, uh, to, the, um, uh, to Finland and the, and the scheme that they had introduced and then uh, plan to, to, to withdraw. Uh, we have also, to be honest, received from the European Parliament, as the European Parliament can submit requests for pilot projects and preparatory actions with a view to a possible future initiative, Parliament have submitted the, the, some proposal in that, in, in that regard, which did not um, meet the, 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 all the level of scrutiny inside this house. Uh, to say that in this moment there is something on which we will deliver on this, it will not be true. Uh, so, and as said, the, the, the reference as an example to assess empirically the, the, the minimum, uh, um, the universal guaranteed uh, minimum income is Finland. Michelle, what's your view on that? Um, well, I suppose the first thing is that they're two very different things, like the minimum income, as mm. it's outlined, is, you know, a minimum standard of living for people of working age and their families with no other means of support, where, you know, a basic income is everyone getting a modest yet unconditional income and you, you can top it up at will from income from other sources. So they're two very very different uh, concepts and things. And I suppose just to speak to, to Dave's point about a pilot, I mean, there, there's um, in the, I'm looking at a national level now, we have a commitment in the programme for government here for a pilot basic income in the budget. There, were, there was funding announced uh, for this pilot. The details are still very unclear, but it's, it's funny. It's sectoral, Michelle, isn't it? It's for it's, artists, yeah. yes. And um, but the details are still really unclear. But what I what I would say to that is like, given the challenges we're facing, even sectorally in terms of the green transition and the impact that that is going to have on jobs and employment even regionally in Ireland, it's really, really important that we get the basic income pilot right here because we have an opportunity then to look at if you get the pilot right, you can look at can it be rolled out to other sectors of the economy? For example, as we begin and Ireland faces significant challenges in terms of transitioning to a greener economy and support certain sectors who will be significantly impacted. So we have to get the pilot right. So we have to get the level of the basic income right you know, run the pilot for at least five years and do all of the, the analysis, not only the economic impacts, but the social impacts, the, the impact of rolling it out to society as a whole, to different sectors, the impact on the exchequer and all the changes you will have to make um, throughout the process as you see in real time what happens uh, when you begin to implement a basic income system and how it inter interacts with other other elements of society. So I suppose I'll give that answer in, in, in national terms there. Great. Thanks very much, Ryan, Michelle. And you're right, it, it will be. Sorry, Santini, yes? Allow me to come in since uh, Michelle's yes. mentioning sectors. Um, and just to say maybe a bit more. Um, what my commissioner uh, would like to investigate more uh, with regard to an approach which uh, is universal is uh, maybe focus on youth. Uh, in the sense that the idea would be that um, focusing on that particular phase of life where uh, um, young people are moving out of education, move to training, apprenticeship and access to the labour market, which is very difficult in many member states, also due to the fact that there is a lot of precarious jobs uh, out there. Uh, the, the attempt would be, if ever we manage, to have it targeted to the youth so that in that case we don't look at income we don't look at but because it's targeted to that phase moment in life voila this is what I, maybe i can i could say i've said more yes no I, I i think it's a very good point actually particularly in light of the issues we're going to have around youth unemployment that's very much recognized and, and secondly, actually there'll be a lot of um is the word profit again socially in, in, in that respect. Um, another question here, Santina. How likely is it is the EU to make the pillar of social rights legally enforceable? 
Well, uh, you know, the, uh, what, because here we have to be clear. Uh, one thing is uh, to have the social pillar and such enshrined in the treaties as it's the objective and also part somehow also the discussion within the, the conference of the future of Europe. And I think that if there is a window of opportunity to open up the discussion on treaty changes, we will have to plead and we will all fight for the social dimension to be adequately uh, enhanced and um, with, with the appropriate legal basis. And um, that, but that to be realistic and to be honest, I don't know if it is an horizon which is really at reach from, from, from here and to, to uh, uh, during the mandates of this commission. But the pillar becomes legally enforceable through the measures that we are adopting. So well, uh, many of them are legal, uh, directives on the minimum wage, if we take directives on platform, platform workers, we have taken directive on um, transparent and predictable working conditions. We are uh, updating directive on health and safety at the workplace. Many of the actions that we are adopting under the umbrella of the pillar under the different principles are legally binding. So let's not forget or overlook this because sometimes we just say, yeah, the pillar is just, uh, is just a commitment. Political commitment doesn't have any, any concrete or mandatory effect. It's not true because many of the measures are taken with a legislative proposal. Many are not because, because of the treaty, like for, uh, uh, um, and, and for instance, for the child guarantee and the minimum income, we, we, we were really assessing the leeway we had in, in legal terms to come up with, with, with directive. My commissioner would really be ready to, to, to use and forcefully legal basis, but we deal with what we have. But it would be unfair and not true to say that there is no uh, legal binding uh, measures taken under the pillar. Yeah, Michelle, that, 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 that's fair enough, isn't it? That where, whereas the pillar itself may not be legally enforceable, the individual actions coming in under it uh, would have that authority. Yes, and, and some of them would, as Santina pointed out. And I suppose it's, that makes it all the more important, really, to, I suppose, integrate it into the, the semester itself and integrate it more into the country-specific recommendations and, I suppose, some of the macroeconomic policies so that we see recommendations, for example, you know, if member states are not meeting their targets around child poverty, for example, that you see a country specific recommendation around this or around youth unemployment or young people not engaged in employment, education or training. So that it's not that we don't just see country specific recommendations focus solely on the economic issues and, the you know, issues around the stability and growth pact or uh, national debt, for example, that we begin to see a more social element there. So you see the real integration within the semester, both of the that the pillar of social rights and the, the global goals are fully integrated in within the European semester. And I think that would give it greater prominence at a national level as well. If I may also, yes. um, following up on what Michelle says, so if we're looking at policies and we're looking at the semester and especially thinking what will happen after that escape clause um, uh, will cease to apply and uh, I think that we, we have to look at what's going on with the view to the review of the semester and the economic governance. First of all, there is the in consultation and I really encourage um, uh, your association to participate to the consultation that the European Commission has launched on the future of the economic governance to put uh, the, uh, the social employment dimension in the core also of the assessment of this review. And then I would like to put at your attention an ongoing debate to which you are very much interesting, and my commissioner has already expressed his support. Uh, some member states have put forward a proposal. It started from Belgium and Spain. It was discussed at the European uh, <laughs> the Labour uh, Minister Council of in October of setting up a fully fledged social imbalances procedure within the semester. We are doing that kind of exercise in the semester, but it's kept at the level of the committee. So the employment committee, the social protection committee. We want to raise the profile of that exercise. 
as it will be then going in parallel with the macroeconomic imbalances procedure, which has a corrective arm, which in reality has never been used because of political reasons, and I would say luckily. And uh, then I, I think that we are uh, looking at this with very much interest. And if associations like your civil society and, and trade unions and so on and social partners would push this, this uh, idea that will also help us to, to get it through. Indeed, uh, taking it from the bottom up is a very good way of putting it. Um, another question, and this is from actually one of our speakers in the next section, Maria Pet uh, Maria asks, has DG employment and social affairs factored in the effects that the reinstatement of the SGP, even in a slightly modified form, will have on the social goals set for 2030? Well, uh, this is uh, a follow-up to what was saying. Um, of course, uh, we know that uh, up at the end of 22, the escape clause will cease and we are working at, we have started the process of updating the economic governance. That's why I was mentioning the social imbalances procedure, because we want to be in this discussion, uh, keeping the social and the, and the employment dimension high. Uh, now, uh, I think that the wind has changed, but not totally changed. The wind has changed and we have seen it in the reply and the de measures deployed after the COVID-19 crisis. But now there are uh, voices saying that, well, the, the recovery is on the right track and now we have to go back to the past. We cannot go back simply to the past. We, we, we don't think it's the right thing. Now, if we have, we haven't, uh, measured yet uh, as such uh, scientifically what the, the, um, the, the discontinuing the escape clause would mean also because uh, we uh, are still committed with the RRF, so the resilience facility, to implement the plans, meeting the country specific recommendation of 2019-2020, 40% of which were for employment and social aspects. Uh, and um, therefore, that's why here, the, the, the key moments, the moment of truth will be what we put forward for the review of the economic governance. And there, of course, uh, um, we know, and I, would, I do not deny that the strength of um, RDG, but the strength of labor minister in, in, in a phase that we the finance minister is <laughs> sometimes unbalanced. But we, we, uh, we will anyway monitor very closely uh, all the social expenditure uh, in the member states and now uh, uh, suspending um, the escape clause and being faced with a new scenario uh, is difficult to um, start to calculate now what will mean because we do not have yet the new rules or the interpretation for the new rules. But at least we are monitoring social expenditure very closely and we have this approach, this methodology that we have developed uh, in, in relation to the um, RRF. Grand, Santina. Um... Just, and we're just slightly cut by the clock, but just uh, one other question here from Julia uh, Buki, who is, um, thanks to speakers for their, uh, all the, um, the presentations, and she would like to ask, if any part of the programmes described focus on mental health and physical health, that there's been a lot about income and unemployment, poverty protection, but uh, whereas Julia is suggesting the money can help, there is an underlying issue and uh, a lot of issues obviously connect with mental health, particularly, I think, something we're all far more aware of as a result of the pandemic. Um, Michelle, do you want to touch on that first and then I go to Santina? Sorry, Mick, I'm muted there. You're yes, on. I mean, I suppose I focused on the, um, the, the, the I suppose, the, the headline target areas. Uh, but there, there are, you know, there's a work-life balance principle. There's a uh, principle 10 on healthy, uh, safe and well-adapted work environment. And then principle 16 is specifically on healthcare, that everyone has the right to timely, uh, timely access to affordable, preventative and curative healthcare of good quality. So is that, that is the principle there that you will have the elements of, um, that Julia mentioned in terms of, of mental health um, and, and where and obviously the pandemic has you know led to a huge focus on mental health and will probably lead to a, a I suppose an increase in, in these issues into the future. So I suppose it'll be at a member state level really though 
as to how that, that, that principle is delivered and how member states themselves, um, you know, deliver timely access to the mental health services and other health services that people require. And Santina? Yes, this is a very important question because I will also very briefly mention the health and safety of the workplace. We have adopted in May the new strategic framework for health and safety. There is a lot of legislation. We are updating the carcinogens and mutagens directive, and we will come forward with a very boost on the updating the asbestos directive and limiting the exposure, the, um, the threshold of exposure limit. But in this framework, we have also uh, announced that we will come forward with an initiative on mental health. It will not be for 22, because uh, here we do not do it in isolation again, and we have to work with DigiSunday. We are preparing and collecting not only evidence, but to see because uh, how, how we can go forward in putting a, an initiative, a commission communication to the member states. It will be in 23. We are working on this subject because it's very important. And linked to that, partially but linked to the issue of, of um, mental health and as you mentioned Mick uh, given the, 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 the change of uh, uh, the world of work also pushed by the COVID we are uh, following up very closely on the European Parliament on a legislative um, resolution on the right to disconnect and telework. We, will, uh, we are engaging on that. We will launch a study. We will engage with the social partners, well, not with a, uh, with a, uh, with a conference uh, uh, for gathering evidence, because there, too, uh, we would like to see if there is the possibility at European level to set a, a framework, uh, because uh, setting so limits um, for connection and disconnection and uh, ensuring the adequate conditions uh, for telework and so on and so forth is part of the package of ensuring mental health in a changed and changing world of work and world uh, and work environment. Santina, thank you very much for that. Um, and that brings us to the end of our first session. Um, timely so, even though there are some more questions, but just in terms of keeping up with the programme, I would like to thank very much Santina Bertolesi and Michelle Murphy for your contributions in this session. We're going to take a quick break. And we'll be back very promptly at 11.30 uh, Greenwich Mean Time, Irish time, to uh, continue the conference. Thank you all very much. Thank you.